have not already uh, checked in, if you could go ahead and please do that while we're waiting for everybody to um, get in the session. You can do that by either clicking on the link that's provided in the chat or the uh, just scanning the QR code. And as always, if you could please introduce yourself with your name and pronouns in the chat, we greatly appreciate it. Um, and welcome to Epidemics of Injustice, Health Equity for Everybody. We'll have time for questions at the end and please feel free to use the comment uh, box to ask those questions that we'll get to. Uh, next slide, please. Just as a reminder, participant controls, everybody was muted upon entry and we will unmute you when it gets to that Q&A portion of the presentation. Uh, just a reminder too of the instructors of the course and that the course is free and open to the public. This first part is and that it does prepare public health leaders and community members with the tools to bring about social change and address structural determinants of health. Um, I do want to just remind everybody about the community guidelines and expectations that we have for not only students, but the community members that do join us for this portion. Um, please listen with an open mind and also have res mutual respect and appreciation for one another. Um, we just ask that you respect the privacy and personal information shared in this space because a lot of these this content brings up stories that are personal and private. Um, do let everyone participate. And I just wanna note that if there's any disruptive and disrespectful language, it will not be tolerated and it will result in the removal from the session. And we understand, like I mentioned, that a lot of the content that we do share on a weekly basis can be difficult to digest. So if you find it difficult to discuss or um, if you need to step away, please do so and just take that time to take care of yourself during the presentation. Do you want to just remind everybody of the land acknowledgement? The University of Illinois at Chicago stands on the original homelands of the Miami Three Fire Peoples, the Ojibwe, uh, Ottawa, and Potawatomi, who have been stewards of this land for generations. Illinois is also home to the diverse Native community of more than 75,000 tribal members, many of whom live in the Chicago area. And for those of you who are not currently residing in the Chicago area, we do encourage you to look into the Indigenous people of your own lands. So we are very excited for week five. Our topic today is on immigrant and refugee health. And I am um, excited to introduce Chantelle Hoskins-Snelling, who is actually an alumni of the UIC School of Public Health. And she's currently a public health administrator for the Illinois Refugee Health Program, which sits within the Center for Minority Health Services in the director's office at the Illinois Department of Public Health. She is designated at the Illinois Refugee as a uh, as the Illinois Refugee Health Coordinator, a position required by the Federal Office of Refugee Resettlement for states that operate refugee resettlement programs. And in her role, she provides health expertise and manages, coordinates, and provides technical assistance in core areas, which include initial medical screening and surveillance, ongoing health care, health education, partnerships, and outre outreach. And she's particularly interested in theory and practice aimed towards achieving, achieving racial equity and justice in health care and has consulted as an equity auditor for national and international organizations. And so Chantel, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay. Hi everyone. Um, thank you for having me. I am Chantel. And so, wow, I'm more nervous than I thought I would be actually. <laughs> uh, so I was expecting to be a co-presenter for this, um, but it turns out I'll be flying solo. So what I've done is prepared about 30 minutes for you um, of a introduction to some concepts that are impactful for my work um, as the state's refugee health coordinator and a public health administrator at the Illinois Department of Public Health. Um, as a UIC SPS, SPH alum. I'm super excited to be here, but just as nervous. Um, so I hope you find this uh, time to be engaging and impactful. Um, again, I'll take about 30 minutes of your time and then I will uh, take about 30 minutes of your time presenting some very high level uh, concepts, mostly on refugee health, to be honest. Um, but a little bit of it will definitely cover some overarching themes for the greater health of like all immigrants. Um, 
if you I hope you will have some questions at the end, just so that we can engage in dialogue, since I don't want to cheat you out of the hour that you might have committed to being here. Um, as was already mentioned, a bit more about me is that I work for the Illinois Department of Public Health as a public health program administrator. Um, I've been with the agency for about six years, I think, but only in this role as the refugee health administrator for about a year and a half. And in that year and a half, I've also learned a ton about this work. Um, and I just noticed, if you don't mind, next slide, uh, please. Thank you. Uh, and so I've been in this role, as I was saying, for about a year and a half. I've learned a ton. I really enjoy it. I find the work to be super rewarding and impactful. Um, every day, it's something different. I felt like every day I learn something new, um, which really helps to keep me going. And so um, I want to also point out just because I think I might have to, um, being a state employee, the disclaimer on the slide that I'm not here in any cap official capacity representing the state of Illinois or the Illinois Department of Public Health. Um, so that means that everything in this presentation is a thought, opinion, or fact of my own and not representative of any organization or individual um, that I might be associated with. And another disclaimer is I have two dogs here in the house with me. If they bark, I'll just pause until they calm down. Um, and I do have some notes with me. So if I'm looking off to the side, I'm probably just glancing at those notes. Um, so now, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the first thing I wanna share with you actually is a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And this quote resonates with me um, because I think it's very real in today's healthcare and public health climate when so much is constantly being debated. Um, and in 1966, right here in Chicago at a convention of the Medical Committee of Human Rights, Dr. King said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And it's pretty relevant, right? Um, the human rights of refugees and immigrants has been very vigorously debated in this country, as is, um, you know, is healthcare really a right for any of us here? And so before we get deep into my work, its outcomes, barriers, and any opportunities um, that exist in the field of immigrant and refugee health, I wanted to establish some basics. I think I want to establish them with you because they're just definitions that I think are super important in the work that I do every day um, and very applicable probably to this course. Um, in advance, apologies for any of you who are already experts on this and might already be aware. Um, we'll start with health equity though. And so the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation says that health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. This requires removing obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences, including powerlessness um, and lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education, housing, safe environments, and of course, healthcare. And the CDC declares that health equity is achieved when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential. And no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of their social position or other socially determined circumstances. And so then the next definition, inclusion, um, it's creating environments where any individual or group can be and feel and um, exist as a respected, supported, and valued participant who's allowed to present themselves and all that they are very fully. Um, and something I want to ask you is how do we include immigrants and refugees um, in immigrant and refugee health initiatives? Um, if you have some ideas, please type them into the chat. Um, and do you think that there would be different approaches for, let's say, refugees or immigrants or asylees versus maybe a student that was um, coming to the United States for school. Next, access. So simple one. According to the uh, Institute of Medicine, access is the timely use of personal health services to achieve the best health, health outcomes. And so what 
limits access for refugees and immigrants. If there's any that you can think of, feel free to type them in the chat. Um, and then justice, probably one of my favorite or one of the things that I'm most passionate about in my work is the process of society moving from an unfair, unequal, or an equitable state to one that is fair, equal, or equitable. It's a transformative process that relies on the entire community to acknowledge past and current harms, to reform societal morals, and subsequently the governing laws. Um, proactive enforcement of policies, practices, and attitudes that produce equitable access, opportunities, treatment, and outcomes for all, regardless of the various identities that one holds. And so social justice is the view that everyone deserves equal rights and opportunities. This includes the right to good health. And I want to point out that this, defi this definition hints at the idea of intersectionality, which I think is super important in the world that we live in, but often neglected, right? Um, did you notice where it says for all, regardless of the various identities that one holds? So let's say you travel here from the continent of Africa you're not only going to be, let's say you travel here from the continent of Africa as a woman who was a member of a tribe that practiced female genital mutilation, you lived in a refugee camp, um, and in your culture, it's very patriarchal. All of those things, you being a woman from Africa that is now in the United States, um, this will make you a Black female here in our already patriarchal society, but with a little bit more freedom than you may have had before. You are also a refugee and that impacts your thoughts, your ideas um, based off of experiences you had as that person. And I think that's all important as we consider like how do we create policy or law, um, especially centered around health that allows everyone to achieve equity. Um, then the last two are power and quality. And so for power, um, it's the ability to exercise one's will over others. And they say that power occurs when some individuals or groups wield a greater advantage over others thereby allowing them greater access and control over resources, wealth, uh, over resources. And some things that affect power are wealth, whiteness, citizenship, patriarchy, heterosexism, and education. Um, those are a few of the key social mechanisms through which power operates. And I have another question for you um, so that we can have some dialogue at the end is, who has power when it comes to refugee and immigrant resettlement and refugee and immigrant health? Um, should those people have the power? Why do they have it? And is there any way that we can engage in an effective and meaningful um, power sharing relationship? The last one, uh, quality. Per the Institute of Medicine, this is just the degree in which healthcare services for individuals and populations increase the likelihood of desired health outcomes and are consistent with current professional knowledge. Um, again, I shared these definitions because they're important concepts that I encourage you to really dive deeply into and become very familiar with um, for your personal and professional growth. And I just wanted to summarize a few of them there because each one really could be its own hour long lecture, right? Um, so for the next several slides, see if you can identify where those topics come into play for advancing equity and disarming the mediators of harm for refugees and immigrants when it comes to their health. Next slide, please. So another quick review of something near and dear to me in my work as a public health practitioner. Um, it's a framework and it's the 10 essential public health services. Um, if you're fam familiar with the 10 essential public health services, you'll realize that the new version that was released, I think in September of 2020, um, it replaced the center with equity instead of research. And I think that was a really important um, small change in this frame framework that could be impactful to guide practitioners in how we think about our work and the work we do. And for those of you who are not familiar, the 10 essential public health services describe 
the public health activities that all communities should be undertaking in order to protect and promote the health of all people in all communities. Um, it promotes policies, systems, and overall community conditions that enable optimal health for all and seek to remove systemic and structural barriers that have resulted in health inequities. Um, when it comes to immigrants and refugees, policy really impacts my work, right? Um, it often determines what access refugees and immigrants have to healthcare here, and therefore also the motivation and incentive for systems to create the infrastructure to accommodate these populations and the diversity that lies within, because no immigrant is the same as the next immigrant, no refugee is the same as the next refugee. Um, and so that requires a lot of planning and thought, and it requires a lot of um, effort from many people throughout. And so whether it be adding diverse staff or having in-house interpretation and a plethora of available translated materials about health education topics, or if it's access to care in refugee and immigrant neighborhoods, um, this framework really can provide a foundation I found to assist in how we think through these conversations and dialogues with other community partners or healthcare providers or community-based organizations or community members themselves. Uh, next slide, please. And so now I think I've laid a little bit of groundwork um, for, I guess, the bulk of this dialogue on refugee and immigrant health. Um, the specific high level topics that I wanted to cover are specifically, who are we talking about exactly? Um, what are their needs? What efforts are already established to fulfill their needs? Um, any barriers and opportunities that I've um, experienced in my work? Next slide, please. Okay, and so in putting together this presentation, I realized how important I find language and establishing meanings. Um, so here's some more definitions for you. I'm gonna run through them really quickly though. So um, the Immigration and Nationality Act broadly defines an immigrant as any alien in the United States, except one legally admitted under specific non-immigrant categories. Often those um, admitted under the non-immigrant categories uh, have the intent or option to remain here permanently. Um, so in putting this presentation, oh, sorry. So an alien, a person that's not a United States citizen or a national of the United States, an asylee, an alien in the United States or at a port of entry who was found to be unable or unwilling to return to his or her country of nationality, or to seek the protection, protection of that country because of persecution or well-founded fear of persecution. Um, persecution or the fear of must be based, in the, based upon the alien's race, religion, nationality, member in a particular social group like a certain tribe or political opinion. Um, we also have a concept um, or a visa classification that my program works with called Amerasians was the newest one to me and maybe even the most interesting for some odd reason. Um, but Amerasians are immigrant visas which are provided for the admission of aliens born in Vietnam after January 1st, 1962 and before January 1st, 1976. If the alien was fathered by a US citizen, um, they're able to come here if it was during those times. And this has something to do with when, um, has something to do with when there was a war going on, forgive me for not remembering which one, lots of children might've been fathered in Vietnam by American soldiers. So the next we have Cuban Haitian entrants. Um, these are Cubans or Haitians who entered illegally or were paroled into the United States. Um, and Cubans and Haitians meeting these criteria who have continuously resided in the United States since before January 1st, 1982, and who were known to INS before that date may adjust to permanent residence under a provision of the Immigration Control and Reform Act of 1986. Um, 
The next one, Iraqi and Afghan special immigrant visa holders. You've probably heard a lot about them, especially recently with the evacuation that occurred in Afghanistan in August. Um, these are non-citizens who qualify for green cards upon meeting certain criteria. Um, usually these are individuals who have worked as translators or interpreters for the United States government, either at the embassy in Baghdad or the US embassy in Kabul. And parole is a temporary status actually. A parolee is not guaranteed to be able to stay here. Um, though when you hear the word humanitarian parolee associated with Afghan newcomers, often um, what we think is they are going to be allowed to change their status to asylee, um, the definition I read earlier, to be um, allowed to stay here beyond the term of their parole. And so uh, by definition, legal definition, parole does not constitute a formal admission to the United States. It only confers a temporary status, um, which requires them to leave when the conditions supporting their humanitarian parole status cease to exist. And last but not least, our refugees. Refugee definition is actually exactly the same as the asylee definition, someone who is fleeing their home country due to fear or persecution of fear based on their race, religion, nationality, or membership in a certain social group. The key difference between an asylee and a refugee is that you apply for asylee status at a US port of entry or on United States soil. A refugee applies for that status from abroad. Um, next slide, please. And so this next page of definitions, I included um, non-immigrant situations and the definition for non-immigrant traveler. Um, this is an alien who seeks temporary entry into the United States for a specific pur purpose. The alien must have a permanent residence abroad for most classes of admission and qualify for the non-immigrant immigrant classification sought. Typically, non-immigrants have no intent to permanently remain in the United States. Um, so the examples of this are people coming to travel for tourism, um, business, medical treatments, certain temporary work, one that is um, relevant for Illinois are migrant farm workers also students, international athletes who come here for sport, or those in transit. So maybe like a pilot or someone who um, is making a stop here before going to another country. Um, next slide, please. And so now that I've given you, um, dumped all those definitions on you again, I wanted to talk about how can we reframe language for equity? Um, and so I wanna take a second and just let those definitions simmer for a bit. I wanna ask you, what did you think of them? You can type it in the chat. Um, my next question for you is what are we doing or what are we really saying when we refer to a living, breathing human being as an alien? Um, and I brought that up to circle back to the idea of inclusivity from the other slide. It's how do we accomplish inclusivity when there are structures that sort of avoid acknowledging humanity, whether it's intentional or unintentional? Um, are the health needs of those who we consider aliens different than those who the law defines as humans or citizens? Um, and there's actually a lot of conversation around this um, and the conversation has been ongoing. On the slide, I listed some terms used in immigration law and I note that President Biden um, has called for changing the immigration laws to replace the word alien with the word non-citizen. Um, I also bolded some questions for you on that slide to think about. So what should be used in healthcare and public health settings and reporting? Should we use legal terms? Should we use terms that make people feel more comfortable? Um, some of the terms that I hear used in my work very often are arrival versus entrant versus newcomer versus guest. Um, and so there's a ton of dialogue and debate about why certain terminology should or should not be used. I'll point out a few 
um, of the legal grounds that I've researched and found and stumbled upon in my work. Um, people say it's legally misleading because it connotates criminality when presence in the US without proper documents is a civil offense, not actually a criminal one. Um, some also say it's legally inaccurate because it's akin to calling a criminal defendant guilty before a verdict is rendered. Um, some of the moral grounds include it's a scapegoat for individual immigrants for problems that are largely systemic. Um, or the term increases the American public's tolerance for daily violations of human rights. Um, is the term alien or illegal alien or unauthorized alien? Is it a term um, that we use as a code word for racial and ethnic hatred? Um, and some people feel like the term is outdated, offensive, and implicitly carries with it negative connotations. Um, so with that, the next question that I bolded on the slide is, how does connotation affect people, policy, and programming? Something for you to ponder and or think about um, as you dialogue with each other in the chat. Next slide, please. So um, another one of my, one, another one of the frameworks or things that I learned in school that I find myself thinking about when I'm actually doing my work is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So you've probably seen this um, pyramid before, right? Likely in an intro psych class maybe. Um, so it was created to better understand what motivates people to do what they do. And this model depicts five stages, which are right here on the screen. So I'm not gonna, um, regurgitate that to you, but the thought is that the basic needs are those that most strongly motivate people to take action. And so I bring that up because in the case of refugees, one could pretty fairly assume that they make the decision to leave everything they know, their homes, their families, their friends, um, their work, because the risk or threat to their families is so significant that the pursuit of something uncertain as an alternative is better than where they are. So I think about that a lot when people present issues that they're having um, to me or we talk about maybe cases um, because I don't wanna minimize any little problem that might seem small to others. Um, could be significant to them because these are people who've uprooted everything and have gone through a lot that I've not experienced and will never be able to fully comprehend um, when I'm doing my work. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so with everything um, being said to this point, I want to present some health needs of refugees and immigrants. And I want to note that undocumented immigrants face limited access to health care. Um, because there is federal laws that restrict them from participating in Medicare, Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program and the Affordable Care Act and the ACA marketplaces. Um, but for refugees, they're actually eligible for Medicaid, a program called Refugee Medical Assistance and initial health screening upon arrival to their final destination state. And um, to adjust status from refugee asylee, humanitarian parolee, it usually also requires an immigration physical and completion of a form called an I-693. And that form I-693, it has to be signed off on by a civil surgeon, which is a special designation for certain doctors given by the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. Um, that exam actually can cost hundreds of dollars and is not explicitly covered by any form of insurance to my knowledge. Um, please, if I'm wrong, type that in the chat. And so, even when we bring a refugee here, um, or there's an asylee who's established here who might have a job, um, in order to be allowed to stay here and not face potential uh, removal proceedings or what we call deportation, um, they have to pay hundreds of dollars for a medical exam. Um, and I think that that is a big barrier to having um, equity or justice or good health outcomes for immigrants and refugees. 
And so health insurance, I do want to point out that I think Illinois does a pretty good job. Um, we're the first state to provide coverage for low-income seniors who, whose immigration status disqualifies them from federal programming. And we also have a program that provides Medicaid-like coverage for undocumented seniors, as well as like all children in Illinois, regardless of documentation um, status, are eligible for a Medicaid lookalike program. But even still, there are gaps that do exist. For example, it was brought to my attention a couple of weeks ago, a case of an elderly, um, undocumented senior woman who had cancer. And unfortunately, our lookalike program does not cover long-term care. And so she really needed hospice and did not have family to support her. Um, and so that's one of the gaps that exist. And so something to think about is when put politicians are writing this policy that seems really, really great, and I'm sure it took a lot of dialogue back and forth, um, how was it determined that long-term care would not be included? And why was that determination made? Um, other needs include health education and core care, core, care coordination. Um, and I will just kind of talk about those loosely and maybe even lump them together because they kind of go together. Um, but many immigrants do not come from countries with established healthcare systems like that of the United States, especially not refugees who spent maybe years in refugee camps. Um, so there's a significant need for them to become educated about health topics in particular pre preventative care. And the need also exists for culturally and linguistically appropriate care coordination services from um, what I've seen or my personal opinion about how we can do immigrant and refugee health better. Um, for refugees, my program does have a grant award actually for the purpose of improving access to care coordination and health education. And what we do is partner with two community-based organizations um, and they do a really good job at linking um, eligible populations for the office of federal, the federal office of refugee resettlements, um, eligible benefits, like populations that are eligible for federal benefits. Um, and those include most of those topics, um, most of those visa classifications, excuse me, that I put the asterisks by and read definitions um, to on a prior screen. Uh, next slide, please. And so I tried my best to fit the main highlights of my work onto one slide. Um, I provide a lot of administrative oversight. That's first, because that's the bulk of my work. Um, I work a lot on capacity building and networking within communities and with organizations. I provide um, oversight to seven refugee health screening clinics. Um, there have been four added in the last year, three in the last three to four months. Um, I do a ton of disseminating updated policy and best practices uh, throughout the network. I also monitor and evaluate um, capacity building. I think I mentioned that already, capacity building um, with existing groups and establishing new relationships. And the biggest one I find is change management. Um, there is often or almost always from my experience difficulty in getting people to adapt and be flexible um, to fill in the gaps. So I really have to monitor and evaluate a lot in order to be able to project what's coming and keep people aware of like changes in needs and gaps that we're observing. Um, and I found that change management is really, really, really difficult. Um, especially being in this position for just a year and a half. What do I really know? Um, so next, I think I do outreach and education. So I try to provide technical assistance. I'm a participant in tons of meetings. Uh, my schedule is often booked with meetings and I provide um, education, especially on the pandemic a lot. Right now, I've been providing a lot of updates about Afghan health and what conditions are endemic to the con to the country of Afghanistan and what needs are we seeing um, in people who are being resettled here in Illinois. 
Uh, I do this with community-based organizations. I kind of mentioned those refugee health promotion grantees already that provide uh, care coordination and do a lot of health education work and um, just getting newcomers within the last five years acclimated to the infrastructure um, of health and health services in Illinois. I also reach out to public health and healthcare professionals um, and also those in the pipeline. I actually have a really good relationship with some medical schools. And so I have an opportunity to go talk to them also about the work that I do or help link them to be able to learn um, the skill of being a provider, but also impact communities that are vulnerable and really in need of those services to kind of create like a win-win situation where everyone gets something that they need and everyone leaves with a smile, I like to think. Um, then last but not least, surveillance and research. So I maintain a, a database um, and have access to several databases with information about newcomers to Illinois. My goal is to use those databases to ensure that everyone is getting um, healthcare. And I do uh, currently have a manuscript that's under review. I don't think I'm allowed to talk much about it until it's published. So um, maybe I can come back and talk to you again later and I can share more about that with you. Uh, next slide, please. And so when it comes to medical coverage, um, there's a lot that goes into making sure that a refugee or immigrant does have or does have medical coverage, even when there's programs that they're entitled to. Um, so in order to do this, we have to confirm their status. Um, eligibility determinations must include confirmation of identity, the date that that individual initially became eligible for benefits, um, and sometimes we have to even confirm nationality. Um, often it requires more than one piece of documentation to make all of these determinations, which means that the um, person in need, the refugee or immigrant who needs the medical coverage, must be aware of all of these documents, must be aware that they're needed. Then we have to make sure that caseworkers or individuals um, who are making the eligibility determination are able to understand and read the documents and understand all of the different codes and visa classifications, um, and that people have the funding to have a piece of identification, especially if we need to prove that they're eligible based off of some type of like residency, maybe living in Illinois. Um, for example, that's something that we often want to know, that you are truly a resident of Illinois in order to be approved for Medicaid. So there's just a lot that goes into that as well. Um, I, I bulleted four, um, four services or medical coverage options available for refugees. Um, it's Refugee Medical Assistance, which is a program that will pay for healthcare costs um, for someone new to Illinois within the first eight months of their arrival. They're also eligible for Medicaid. Therefore, in Illinois, we don't use RMA very often because it's often not needed. They'll be covered by Medicaid. We also have the state-sponsored plans, particularly the one that um, makes sure that all children, even if they do not have documentation or legal right to be in the country or Illinois, still have care. And then in Illinois, they also um, have the option of marketplace for refugees and asylees, Amerasians, Cuban, Haitian entrants. You'd go to the marketplace, right, if your income exceeds the federal poverty line limitation for Medicaid or any of the state sponsor plans. And you can go to the marketplace and get a less costly plan, but still expensive if you have like a low paying job, um, which many newcomers will have upon arriving here, even if they had very high powered or high paying or were very well educated in their home country. Uh, next slide, please. And so another big aspect of my work is ensuring that all refugee newcomers to Illinois are linked with care um, for an initial health screening. And so upon arrival to Illinois, they complete a domestic medical screening to identify persons with communicable diseases and poten of potential public health significance, and also um, to enable them to resettle successfully by identifying health conditions that might be acute or chronic, um, which threaten their well-being and their ability to 
um, successfully assimilate into culture here and to have good ongoing health care. And so the Centers for Disease has an elaborate recommendation for refugee health screenings. Um, and some of the things it includes are listed here on the slide. So there needs to be a history and physical. They should be checked for HIV infection. Um, we should make sure they have had or, in, or receiving age-appropriate vaccinations testing for intestinal parasites, lead monitoring, a mental health screen, malaria, nutrition and growth, looking to make sure that they don't, they're not malnourished, um, checking sexual and reproductive health, um, tuberculosis screening and viral hepatitis. And so again, you'll notice that a lot of those things are to protect the communities. So not just the refugee or their immediate family, but also the communities in which they resettle in. Um, and so regarding the screenings, I want to point out that from the few that I've been able to witness in person and from conversations I've had with providers, no refugee screening is the same. Um, and it requires a ton of competence and passion and patience by our providers to do these. And in Illinois, I'm proud to say that the partners I work with do their jobs very, very well and take it very seriously um, and welcome the responsibility that comes with being these initial health screening providers. Um, but it does require a lot of skill on their part and an understanding beyond maybe what it would take to just screen um, U.S. citizens because we don't. I've never been screened for intestinal parasites, for example. I don't think, um, I've probably never been screened for malaria. And in order to assess which screening um, components are needed, you have to really be cognizant and aware and knowledgeable about what conditions are known to exist in that population of people, what diseases are endemic to any particular country of origin. Was it the country that they're born in that might have exposed them to these conditions? Was it where the refugee camp was at that might have exposed them? And so providers who do these initial health screenings are very, very involved. Um, and I just wanna give kudos to any of them who might be on the call or see this later, because I do recognize that it takes a lot of work um, to do those screenings. And that's being convoluted, right, by the fact that they're probably on a language line or using an interpreter um, to get the screening done. So it's not even that it's just a lot more. It's a lot more, and there's a lot more that goes into it um, that are non-provider-like factors, like non-screening things that we need to also be um, aware of. And that's the cultural competence and the um, linguistic capacity, the culturally competent and appropriate linguistic capacity to do them. Um, and so next slide, please. So this slide is about trauma. Um, and that's because in addition to unmet physical health needs, newcomers also um, might be dealing with issues that are a result of past trauma. And it's a topic that is ongoing since day one of taking this job. Uh, mental health and trauma are huge topics. So I wanted to make sure I spoke towards it a little bit. Um, so refugees, again, they're typically fleeing a place that was either devastated by war or violence or because they faced some very serious persecution that placed them in fear of their lives. So that's stressful, right? It sounds stressful to me. Um, it's been estimated that about half of the population of refugees experiences either depression, anxiety, or post-traumatic stress disorder, um, which can, you know, um, you can imagine it will have a disastrous effect on their mental health and also the well-being of their relatives and family and friends. And so traditionally, um, when we think about refugee trauma, it happens in one of three stages or categories, and that's pre-flight, flight, and resettlement. And refugees are very vulnerable to mental health issues due to the high prevalence of stressful experience, experiences before, during, and after their travel here. Um, so the pre-flight pre -flight phase may include physical and emotional trauma um, to the individual or family or violence or witnessing murder even, and just like in general social upheaval, refugees, again, they leave their nation of origin, travel to another country, and then apply from that other country to come to the United States. So they've fled a lot of places, right, um, for fear of their lives. And so the flight phase, 
Um, that includes uncertainty about the journey to the resettlement site. I'm sorry, it includes uh, the flight phase includes uncertain um, journey to the resettlement site, uncertainty about being able to leave the refugee camp, uncertainty about when they'll leave the refugee camp, what's next to come, um, what's going to happen to family and friends whose whereabouts might have been unknown. And then additionally, what can happen, I've read and heard stories about during the flight phase, is children and adolescents being separated from their families. Um, that probably also can happen in pre-flight too, but of course that'll present a ton of stress for the parents, the child and siblings and friends even. Um, and so consider that all newcomers are very much at the mercy of others for care and protection until they can become self-sufficient during the flight and the resettlement phase, um, honestly. And so the last category that we talk about um, as a place that trauma can be introduced into a refugee's life is the resettlement process. Um, and I, we think about cultural bereavement, including loss and grief. And so the resettlement process may include challenges such as the loss of culture, community and language, as well as um, the need to quickly adapt to a new and foreign environment, learn a new language. Um, we've seen or, you know, literature points out that children often adjust, being adjust to the new place quicker than the adults and they're able to straddle the new with the old. Um, but we shouldn't depend on the children's resiliency to accommodate um, the family and the adults. And so we wanna be cognizant of that as providers, either working directly with refugees and people who are traveling to this country from another, that trauma is, you know, like the likelihood of trauma is probably pretty significant. And we wanted to think about that when we're um, creating programming to consider their health, that we don't forget about mental health, um, despite the barriers that we know are going to exist. And so that's actually my next slide. Next slide, please. So my next slide are just barriers to health, not only mental health, but primary health. I've divided them up into structural, cultural, and personal barriers. Um, structural, we have primary care or limited access to mental health care, um, mental health under diagnoses, because tools to screen for mental health um, there's only one that I can think of that's actually been um, created specifically for refugee populations. It's called the RHS-15, um, and it diagnosed, not diagnosis, it can screen for post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression, and I think also panic attacks. Um, but then we also have structurally like language. Everything in the United States mostly is going to be like in... English, um, we have our politics and policy, and then also funding. Um, then we have cultural barriers, which include gender bias or discrimination, um, a stigma associated with going to the doctor or with mental health care, the influence of media on health, um, the influence of the community, family, and support systems. Some cultures I've noticed are very conservative. Um, about discussing their health needs in refugee communities. I'm not 100% sure if it's because they don't want to feel needy, that they don't want to be a burden, or if it's just a, you know, if I don't talk about a problem, it doesn't exist, and we just push through and be resilient. Um, also, there is, of course, religion um, that can be a cultural barrier to people attaining their best health. And then last but not least, personal things. So I put in here ideologies, um, the concept of organic illness and mental health, um, lack of health literacy, and then any stigma they themselves might have about um, the, the network, like the health opportunities here. Um, and so next slide, please. Sorry, I got a little distracted by the chat right there. I'm trying to minimize this. Okay. And so opportunities, this is my last slide. Um, and I wanted to summarize it and not make it too long. So opportunities, I just think that if we could have not only more, but more effective culturally and linguistically competent initiatives to increase and improve education, valuing, 
valuing and accepting people and realizing that everyone has something to offer no matter where they came from um, or what they look like. Better advocacy, more and more effective programming, um, research and volunteering. I think um, some of the things that can be done that would fit in each of those buckets are language classes tailored to specific communities of refugees and immigrants, um, acculturation and ad adaptation services, um, sensitization about mental health disorders to kind of decrease the stigma, access to culturally competent and um, mental health and health practitioners, more funding, um, adult daycare services and friendship classes to involve refugees and immigrants in the communities, um, programs to preserve their families, and then um, definitely advocating for better policy change, changes and programmatic changes. Um, next slide, please. Oh, great. And so that's the end. Thank you. Um, I hope you found that helpful or engaging. I saw lots of like chats popping up. Um, so I guess now we can open up to the Q&A if the moderators um, feel that would be appropriate. I'm not exactly sure. Where do I go from here? Yeah, so what we normally do, um, thank you so much for your presentation, that was great, but we normally do a combination of people raise their hand and they can verbally ask their question, and then we also have some questions that we've collected on the uh, throughout the chat. So if anybody, I'm going to go ahead and give the opportunity for someone to raise their hand and ask the question verbally, and if not, we'll proceed to going in the order of the chat. So we'll give time and space. I do not see raised hands, so I'm going to go ahead and get some from the chat. And I know that there's some that just came in. Um, the first question that I have is about trauma. So basically about navigating trauma as a provider and how providers can support immigrants while also being cognizant of their own boundaries. So they disclose that as a nurse, they have worked with patients that disclose very distressing things. They usually connect them to the social worker or case manager to make sure they get support. So how can providers res respond with compassion while also being mindful of their own traumas that may be triggered slash activated when someone discloses um, these traumatic stories? I think that's a Excellent question. And I know that there is some literature about this. I honestly think that this is not something that I'm going to be the best expert um, to answer because, again, I don't do hands on um, screenings with refugees myself. But I would recommend um, to anyone that you make sure you're putting them in the hands of the person who can best assist them. And so if that's not you recognizing that maybe there's another provider um, in your organization who can relate. And I think that this brings up the point, um, the importance of having diverse public health and healthcare providers, people who can relate or maybe have gone through it um, that'll be able to be empathetic, um, but have learned to learn to navigate um, being uncomfortable in a situation where they also need to provide some level of care. And I will, I see if, if anybody wants to ask a question and you want to raise your hand. If not, I will continue going in the order in the chat as well. Okay, so the question we have is what are the primary ways in which you could encourage people with no clinical skills to participate in welcoming refugees and advocating for better policy? There are 11 resettlement agencies um, in Illinois, and they are usually at the forefront um, from what I've seen in the last year and a half for advocating for refugee causes. Um, there's also other community-based organizations. The first one that comes to mind is ICER that you can partner with um, and reach out and volunteer and see what's 
what do they have um, that you can, how, how you can engage basically, um, how you can engage to advocate. I think that there is a huge push right now for Afghan newcomers um, that were a part of the evacuation that started in August to be able to not go through the one year waiting period before being able to adjust their status to asylee. Um, that's currently a piece of legislation I'm aware um, is being pushed. So identifying what the community needs and what organizations um, are working for that, working towards that and partnering with them directly. There's a lot of established organizations in Illinois and I would, I would just strongly recommend partnering with organizations established to do like that policy advocacy work. And I do want to note that the readings that are also on the drive in as well for the sign readings did come from ICER specifically. So if you do want a direct example of the work that Chantella is mentioning, you can, that, that's part of the reading for this presentation specifically. Um, I want to follow up with another question um, before I ask again if anybody wants to raise their hand that was in the chat that um, I think flows well. How, how have lessons learned during the influx of Afghan youth impacted how we care for unaccompanied minors and other immigrants and refugees? Can you repeat one? How was the influx of Afghan youth? Uh, impacted how we care for unaccompanied minors and other immigrants and refugees. And I can also, I put it in the chat as well. I would say, you know, my lesson learned from the Afghan, the unaccompanied Afghan minors that were resettled um, in shelters in Illinois, the lesson learned from there for me is to reach out to atypical organizations that are providing care for refugees and immigrants um, sooner than later. Uh, because that's not, that was not a program that we were made aware of. You know, actually the way I found out about that is, um, someone in my agency said, did you know there's a flight of 75 unaccompanied um, Afghan minors that are going to be landing at O'Hare today at 11 o'clock, which was like in 30 minutes. And so I think proactively thinking out where the need could be in atypical places was like the lesson learned from that for me. And I'm going to see if anybody ha wants to pose a question, raise their hand. Um, Melanie, you can go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for this interesting presentation, Chantel. I, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I was intrigued by your slide when you were showing the different benefits for the immigrants that um, that there was a special medical fund for them that you, that they tend not to go on as they qualify for Medicaid. Now I was surprised that they were on Medicaid at all, and I'm wondering, you know, why the decision was made to put them into Medicaid rather than that um, special fund for refugees. And uh, another reaction I have is I know someone who is a US citizen who had cancer and lost her job and applied for Medicaid and could not qualify, no matter what she did. So a part of me is also wondering what she would think, knowing that, like, you know, refugees who have not paid into the system were getting Medicaid where, while she wasn't able to. So I'm just curious to know if this is just something in Illinois or, um, you know, if this is standard for all the states to um, have the immigrants get Medicaid versus um, have a different stream of funding for their healthcare. So I think for the first part of your question, based off of what I jot down here, um, my response is that we don't use the refugee medical assistance because they're eligible for Medicaid. And okay. so I am not the um, HFS expert on how we consider the tier of which um, medical program will be offered first. But mm -hmm. my limited understanding is that P 
people are going to be processed to see if they can meet the eligibility requirements for Medicaid first, because that's a federal program. Refugees, asylees, Amerasians, Cuban Haitian entrants are eligible for Medicaid in Illinois. Um, refugee medical assistance is a program that those who are not eligible for or do not meet the eligibility requirements for Medicaid um, have access to for up to eight months, as long as they also meet the refugee medical assistance um, requirements, which are really complicated. Um, I don't think there's going to be an easy way to uh, answer it. At least I'm not equipped right now with an easy, quick way to answer it. But in short, Medicaid is what we will always run people for first. We're going to see if everybody is eligible for Medicaid first. If you're not mm -hmm. eligible for Medicaid, then you will be ran through that system to see if you meet the qualifications and eligibility requirements for any other program that the state of Illinois offers, whether it is federally funded or state funded. Um, as to the second part of your question about a U.S. citizen um, who is not eligible for Medicaid, can't really speak a ton to that. What I will say is that there's a lot more than just citizenship status that goes into processing a Medicaid case. Um, they consider income. So this person might have had some type of severance package or might have been receiving unemployment. Um, could have also had assets that were above what would get you uh, eligible for and approved for a Medicaid case um, as a US citizen. Um, but that's something that's often debated, right? And that's always going to come up are these anecdotal, anecdotal stories about someone who feels they should have been eligible for something, but they they happen to not be. Um, and I don't think I'm going to have a perfect answer again for why she wasn't, but there are certain classifications of um, newcomers and immigrants that are eligible for Medicaid and that and refugees are one of them. And so I can just say that a refugee who meets the income guidelines will probably get approved for the case. Um, whereas a U.S. citizen who does not will not. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Chantal, I want to respect your time. We are a little bit over time, but we have one more person raised their hand. Are you okay with taking that last question? Yeah. Okay, I'll Peggy, my best. your hand is up. So we're going to um, go ahead you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Does your office uh, have a website where you can go to find out how you could, who the agencies are that you could volunteer with, uh, that type of thing as a citizen? I'm a community person, uh, not in your state, but I'm just asking, does your office have a resource website that you would be willing to share? My office does not have a website, but I've just opened up Google and I'll get you the website for the Illinois Department of Human Services, who does have an extensive list of community partners and agencies and ways that volunteers can help and contribute and make donations um, to refugees. There's also 11 uh, resettlement agencies in Illinois, and they would be probably very happy to receive donations or assistance. Um, so just let me get that website and I'll post it in the chat. And we, I can also share, we've been Thank you. compiling a list of organizations within Illinois that individuals can volunteer with. So I'll go ahead and share that as well. And we'll post it to our Google site too. In addition, Chantel, to it, you can add. Um, and I do just have another question for you. Would you be okay um, sharing your email or a way that individuals can contact you for questions? Yeah, I'll put it in the chat. And this is just an initial list, um, but yeah. So just to add that in there. Uh, Peggy, thank you so much for your question. Chantel, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, and I think because we're out of time, we cannot take any more questions. But um, for the students, we'll go ahead and see you all at 640. And for everybody else, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and you all have a wonderful day. Okay, take care.